Hello again and a very good evening to you and a very warm welcome to our little weekly podcast, Sweet Omotown Internet Radio. My name is Don McGurgan and uh, unfortunately due to lockdown I cannot see my little co-presenter Declan Ford, but if the technology works and I press the button B, he should be on the end of the line. Hello Declan. Donald, how are you on this cold, drizzly, miserable night? Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. Such an evening, hey? What a day. Well, the wind is, the wind is howling. Yeah, well, it's winter. Well, who knows? The winter of our discontent, mm. the glorious summer by the sun of yes, God. Yes, Well, do you think we have a vaccine, or do you think we're being... I think, I sincerely hope we do. Yes. You know, we I... will. Are we look, just jump at anything. You know, and that's the way I look at it. You know, you're right. I think at the end of the day, if people see some sort of end game in this, um, I think that's possibly going to create a good feeling. And certainly the markets have responded well financially and things as well. Oh, so that's it. That's it. So, I don't know. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I think so. That could be the Biden effect as well. But I think it's more the vaccine that's going to well, this little ray of light. Yes, yes. So, pl- so we all need that. We are the placebo effect. We cure you, we don't know how. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Oh, indeed. Oh, well. You didn't hear that coming on <laughs> it down the road, did you? Oh. Tell you, no. all in the future. Ah, all in the future. Aye, aye. Oh, no, on, a, on a serious note, it's very sad to learn about Brian Call passing so quickly on us, wasn't it now? It was indeed. No, he, he was a wonderful raconteur, you know, and just a, a great gift with words. And I see Father Darcy referred to him as a genius, you know, and I, I don't think he was too far off the mark. Not in the know, slightest, no, no. He, you know, he, he blazed the trail, and uh, to his eternal credit, he never forgot Oma. No. You no. know, and he was very true to his roots, and he had time for everybody. You know, yeah. so look, he'd be badly, but he, he was a fixture in the town, and he would... He will be sadly missed. Mm. And that we, we interviewed him quite early. That was quite early. Well, early, early by our standards, I suppose, on one morning and it was Saturday. And uh, he must have got new Duracell batteries in or something, technically, for he was in full flight. He but, was huh? uh, excellent. He was, he was, a, it was a lovely interview. And uh, oh, he was a great tune all together. And um, yodeling and singing and talking and uh, oh, phenomenal. You know, Marvelous. Probably one of the last interviews he ever gave, but probably the very last one, maybe. I would say so. Mm. I would say so. We were yeah. very lucky. We were. we were very, very lucky, you know. And it's he, nice that you know that it, it was Oma, and he, he talked very fondly of the town, growing up in the town, and that was probably his first love. And you know, even maybe you know he he could have had opportunities further afield. He often said that, but declined yeah. for 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 family and friends and Oma. And you know, when all shakes yeah. down, didn't he do the right thing, really? You know. No, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and. Uh, yeah. yeah, he he. As I say, he will be very, very sadly missed and badly missed, and uh, not, not only in Uma, but in the, you know, I would say nearly every dance hall in the country. Yeah, and across the water, and of course, friends in Nashville as well. And, and it was a testament, you know, when when um, you know, you see some of the folks who attended the funeral who made the long journey up, you know, and to stand and and to, you know to wait for the cortege to pass and the pass, and then family were, I think, so grateful and so gracious. You or, know, or, and uh, it was just, mm-hmm. and, and it was nice to talk. We, you and I had a little word with with Father Brian, and uh, it was it was nice to reacquaint ourselves. With him, you know, yes, yes. And of course, he and Brian call uh, go go back many many years. You know, and I think yeah. he, I think he in particular found it quite hard and quite. He said he he was heartbroken. You know, you you Brian, yes. You know, and then to to bury a friend like Pio uh, McCann just some weeks that's earlier right. as well. So, that's uh, right, you know, that's right. it's just. Uh, it makes it all very difficult now, but oh, of course, uh, you know of it's, it's strange. You know, he didn't get the send off that he so much deserved, and that's just the nature no. of the beast that we're we're going through at the minute. Yeah. But, but strange yeah. enough, on Thursday morning, I happened to be down past the Sacred Heart quite early, but half eight or quarter to nine, and the church was open, and I walked in, there was nothing, no one in the church, only myself and, and Brian's remains were there. So mm-hmm. I got the chance just to say a very personal goodbye and a thanks to him that's because. Lovely. Over the years, he was very good to me because I would been involved in fundraising for for care for cancer and cancer research mm-hmm. and, and various charities. Mm-hmm. You didn't have to ask Brian twice, you know. He just yeah. what, what time? Give me the date. I'll be there. He was right. there, you know, and he always turned up. You think, God, he's going to appear at all. Next thing you see, this green jacket walking across the stage, and you know, he just took it from there. Let there no rehearsing. Let there no sound checks. Nothing. Just get on the stage and do it and engage with with, with the public. But well, the, the first the time I, I encountered him at, at, a, at a, a sort of a session, if you want to call it uh, uh, like that, uh, was in Mountfield Sports. 
over 40 years ago. And I really, you know, hadn't, uh, you know, dipped my toe into Oma over the years. You know, I, I really wasn't au fait with, with uh, show band music and whatever, you know, all those years ago. And uh, Brian was the special guest at Mountfield Sports. Yeah. Now, you can imagine it was no Olympics. But he was there, and I vividly remember it, and he sang his heart out, no accompaniment, no backing, beside a, a little van with a tinny speaker. And, you know, had he been singing in Carnegie Hall or the Grand Ole Opry, he couldn't have given as good as a professional, uh, uh, you know, yeah. an appearance yes. and performance. You know, and I thought that was the measure of the man, that, that yes. he, he put his heart and soul into it, and if he could help others, Yes. He did it with a heart yes. and a half. He had no ego. He just, he just, he just loved Oma, and loved his music, and loved his family. And you know, and we will miss all that about him as well. You'll just yeah. miss his presence because you, if you met Brian oh, outside yeah. Duns or Lidl or Asda or some of those shops uh, and have a conversation with him, you just hope you'd no frozen food in your bags because it was going to be the frost at the yeah, day you got yeah, home. Yes. He would. I think, uh, I, I think to use, I think the technical terms, he had the gift of the gab. Well, certainly he had an abundance. Eh? Mm-hmm. He had indeed. indeed. Uh, indeed. And I, have some, uh, you know, and I have some other wee bits and pieces of them from even going back to hospital radio days. So maybe with the family's nice. permission, Declan, over the weeks, we might do another wee special tribute to Absolutely. Brian. That'd be nice. I Absolutely. Of course, it would be a lovely thing to do. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll let the, the, as the man says, we'll let the hair sit. We will so indeed. things are just a wee bit better. Certainly and then we'll, yes. we'll run it by them, you know. We will indeed. We will indeed. Yeah. All right. Oh, well. Anyway, we had a little chat last week with our good friend Chris McGill. Mm-hmm. A little Zoom call, and that will go out the subject of a little program tonight. If you want to maybe tell the good folk what it's about. It's about one man's life and his journey through life. And, um, yeah, with the twists and turns and the ups and downs. And uh, uh, Chris, or Christy, I think as he's called here, is re- remarkably honest and very open. And he just tells it as it is or as it was. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an Oma story as well, although it finishes up maybe in a, in a you see, in a bear pit in, in, in a finance house in London somewhere. But he mm-hmm. applies the same logic that, that stood him good stead when he was a young man as well. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would have walked in the bars as a, as a young lad after school. I would have washed bottles and tidied the stock and, 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 and carried Guinness and stocked the shelves and various things from, from after school to, to late into night. And I would have knew Christy very well, knew all the family very well, because I came in mm-hmm. after his father died. Um, to, to help out and uh, my brother worked the bar full time so I was a sort of a, the hired help in at, at the weekends uh-huh. and things so I, yes. what, what he talks about I, I lived it with him so I know very well and it's 100% accurate what, what he talks about yes, the feelings yes. and, and the emotion behind it as well yeah. and yeah. Uh, that's sort of an upbringing you know you think okay it's difficult and he, he makes no bones about that but I think you know there's an old saying what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and he's certainly living proof of that Declan Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, yes, it was a very engaging interview. And, uh, and you know, and of course, he talked about the book that, that uh, he, he has just written, uh, mm. The Humpty Dumpty Man, you know, yes. uh, Life Rebuilt. And um, I was heartened to hear that another Oma man, a great actor called uh, Colm Gormley, yes. is uh, doing the audio version. Yes. And Colm is now, I believe, in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, and uh, when I many years ago in my former life as a teacher, I, I did a, a few shows and Colm acted, and and you could see then at the at the tender age of seventeen or eighteen that he really had something, you know, he had that spark that's needed, yeah, you know. And um, it's great to see that he has he has reached the heights that he has in London. Great, mm-hmm. and I wish him all the best. And actually, look forward. I mean, I have Christie's book, but I, I look forward to hearing the audio book. The audio book. I'm better man to do it. Of course, I'm you know. funny. I, I'm going to look. I'm waiting forward to get the audio book as well because I think it, it'll be special when you hear. I know my dialect and, uh, yes. and, and the story and, and how they will make that fit and tell a, a worldwide audience. It'll be lovely to see how they're going to do it. And he quotes. Oh, yeah. The quotes he needs at, at some stage. I want to try and put it into the program as well somewhere if we can good, as well. Good. There's a wee bit of video of that that Chris has sent me and a couple of oh, photographs okay. of, of growing up in the bar. And of course, the great and good will get to see you and I, Declan, in the flesh. <laughs> You with a little two pound camera, my with a little three pound fifty camera, <laughs> shouting down the lens at it. Hmm? A, a gold ring and roaring, <laughs> I think, would be the term. Ah, uh, sure, whatever, yeah. whatever. Well, look, we'll, <clears throat> we'll be grand, you know. Look, I, I don't think we'll frighten the folks now, you know. Not, no, not at all. No. If, the, the, if, 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 if they've survived the coronavirus, they'll survive us, Donald. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I, I spoke to an ex-teacher of mine at, at Brian's funeral yesterday. And 
typical wit of Omar. He says, you and Ford will go down in history and geography and miles. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, so Hard about the old ones. Aye, the old, old teachers. Yeah, we still <laughs> wear the same clothes and, and tell jokes. the same jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no. oh no! So oh well, look. Uh, but certainly now, uh, Christie's Christie's story is is it's yeah. unique, and and you know a difficult tale at times. And and yeah. he, he he approached it with fierce honesty, and that's the measure of the man, you know. It is indeed, and the book is available as well as the audio download. I'm not sure if it's just completely finished or not, but it will be in, in the very near future. So, uh, but it's Christmas box, you know, if you want to treat yourself or some of your family to. To the book. Oh, indeed. Um, Absolutely. From a, from Absolutely. You know, good, a great, good. Great, great memoir. <gasps> right, Mr. Ford, we shall, that little dark evening, we shall go now and light the fire. I indeed, yes. And I, and shall, I shall put the feet, and you know what, I'm, I'm, you know, there's no more gardening to do. Look. And the West Wing, the West Wing is painted now, yes. And the, the, the West Wing, I think I can start in the East Wing now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could no, have a squatter, you could I, have a squatter in I, the I West should. Wing, then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I uh, you know, no. I'm a creature of habit. Coming into the autumn, I think it's time to relax and <laughs> get into the winter to wilt away. <laughs> Till the new year. <laughs> to let the frost get at me toes. Ah, you'd be great. And then go into hibernation. Yes, yes. You know, and then be renewed and reinvigorated in the springtime, ready to fight another day. Like yes, yes. The, late, the great Liam Clancy used to quote Bertolt Brecht. Uh, the, the the man who wrote Mother Courage, and he said, he said, with a man's dying breath, he should be getting ready for the next battle. You know, yes. just we will fight on to the bitter end. Yes, yes. Well, you know. yes. Do you, do you light a fire? Because I, I always light a fire in the winter. I light a fire most time of the year, but certainly every, every winter I sort of hibernate into one of the rooms with a with a little multi fuel yeah. stove. And most people well, don't well, now have oil and I've got gas both, but I prefer to light a fire to. Chopped well, meat. I have got. I bought a little, a little small. Are we allowed to advertise a, no. a Stanley Stan. wood burning stove? A little, the smallest one, and the heat that comes out of it is remarkable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I have it in a, what used to be a garage. I've converted it into a little, a little sitting room. You know, because as you get older, you retreat, and you go out of the big room into the wee room. Is you know, is, and is, as long as you have a- access to the kitchen. The toilet and the bedroom, that's all you want. All on the same floor as well. All on, and within <laughs> probably you know, 10 foot of each other. Oh, forgive you. Tell me, it's, and, uh, is it, it's your man's shed, is it? You call it your man's shed? Do you, do you keep oh, little... no, no, no. This no? is the Ford abode. Oh, I see, right. No, it's I have a the actual shed, right? house, the hacienda. No, mine's is just one room fits all. Right, right. Oh, no, I, sofa like, bed I like on the it fire. All, yeah. hmm? I must tell you a story. I, I, as a student teacher, I was doing teaching practice in Fentina. Under, uh, under the late great Vincent Cunningham in St. Lawrence's Primary School. And I was staying with a lovely lady, Mrs. Grimley, who lived in, in uh, just off the Derry Road at Gord Rush. And I had a pair of Clark shoes with kind of rubber, th- maybe they were thick rubber soles at one point, you know, and they seemed to have these molded soles. And these had just come in and I thought they were the most wonderful things. And she had a fire roar, and it was a, it was maybe early in springtime, but still quite cold. And I sat and blethered away, and when we feet at the fire, and I noticed the smell of burning, and did not, and talked away, and, and I could notice this. And then the, the soles were that thick. <laughs> it took about ten minutes before it started to permeate the soles of my feet. <laughs> and I realised it was my shoes were on fire. <laughs> I know you thought you walked in water, but <laughs> oh, I know, not, not through fire as well. Hmm? Well, you know, I, I, all, uh, always, you know, ah, and well. uh, I'll never forget it. All right, all right. Oh, no. oh good. All right, we'll leave you in, in the company of uh, Chris McGill and his memoir, and you give us the name of the book, Declan, and tell the people where they can get it as well. It's can. the Humpty Dumpty Man, A Life Rebuilt. Uh, no, the interview is not necessarily all about the book. It is not. It's about yep. Christy talking about his life and then how the book slotted into that. Yes. And the cathartic uh, influence of the book and... Uh, you can get it from Amazon, and yeah. the audio, as you said, I think they were just finished in the edits when yes. we talked to Christy, so uh-huh. that should be available fairly soon. So, and if you could, as Donald said, for the Christmas, you want get it, it. And if buy you it. 
please give it a review as well because the more books, the, the more the better reviews the books get, the, the more sales they get. I'm sure Chris would love to see got right up, right right up to the bestseller list because it is, yeah. it has the potential because he has such a broad bandwidth of, of people that he knows in his career and stuff. So it'll it, yeah. it, it'll resonate with a lot of people in different ways. Maybe people will yes. resonate his age group going up in Oma and John Street, and yes. all the people will remember him from his accident and his recovery and then going to London and you know there's a whole story for everybody in this book so enjoy and enjoy the company of Chris and Miguel okay David we'll see you again take care of yourselves and uh, until then all the best alright take care later. bye bye bye, bye. bye. hello again and a very warm welcome to our Sweet Home Town internet radio our weekly podcast and uh, joined as usual by our co-host Declan Forward and our very special guest on Zoom this morning is Christian Miguel from John Street Corner, I suppose for want of a better word. You're all very welcome, good to have you with us here on, on our little podcast. Chris, how's life in England? Tell me before we start at all, are you in the lockdown or what are you doing? Well, it's, it's the strangest thing, there's a new lockdown supposed to have started this morning, but I, I was driving my children to school, so I've got kids, um, one at Bath University, but Others age 17, 15 and 12, and, and they're all at school locally. And I had to do two school runs this morning because my daughter was out early and, and, and the roads are very busy. And there's no sign of much of a lockdown here, to be frank with you. Uh, lots of white vans running around. And, um, you know, I had a visitor here this morning from British Gas. So not, a, and that was to put, install some sort of a meter. But anyway, I hadn't time to talk to him. So um, um, there's, um, there's not much sign of a lockdown, I'm afraid, here. I don't know what it's like over there. Okay, well, business as usual for, for ourselves here, pretty much in, in Oma as well. But anyway, Chris, if, uh, if we take you back before to, to your earliest memories of John Street, because I would have shared some of your early childhood with you by reverting to the fact that I worked in, in the bottom store of the pub that you, that you were reared in. So you and I could maybe have a lot of similarities and people we would have known and grew up with and those people who would have influenced us. And uh, Declan, feel free to chip in as well and, and tell us all about your memories as well. So just take us back to the very start, Chris, if you don't mind, and paint a picture for me of what Oma was like for you growing up. Well, you know, I, I think it's very different, you know. I mean, a generation, listen to Jackie McGale, it was it was almost romantic, and I, and I loved it in its own way, you know, St. Eugene's band and, and you know, going through the town, and and, and that was lovely, although I did, I did identify with him you know, throwing stones at, at the... Uh, at the labor hall, you know, and banging off that old uh, tin, tin roof they had on it at the time was more for the noise than anything else. But I suppose when I was growing up, it was slightly different. I mean, guys were throwing bottles over the top of the labor hall at, at the army sentry post at, at the, at the, um, at the um, uh, back of the post office. I mean, not me, because I would have been six or seven years old, but nonetheless, that's what was going on. You know, it was a very different world at the start of the Troubles. And, uh, you know, the story I've written, The Humpty Dumpty Man, which uh, the title relates to my car crash where they put me back together again and called their, me their Humpty Dumpty man. And, and I was the beneficiary of, you know, uh, unfortunate beneficiary, unfortunate, as you, as you might say, um, of, you know, a, a, a hospital dedicated to major trauma because of the troubles. So, you know, there's different elements. But come back to Oma, um, my memories of Oma are very different. You know, obviously, um, you will know I, I never knew my father. You know, uh, he died when I was three years old. But I did, did remember, and I've identified in the book, and, and your reference there yourself, Don, um, you know, the bottling store and the Guinness bottles and, and, and what that would have meant mm -hmm. in terms of pride within the family and pride within, and within the region of, you know, trying to be the best at, at that bottling Guinness. And, and um, uh, you know, as I said, we, we sold 8,000 bottles. Uh, that's a statistic I got, I think, from you, actually. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, Benny Livingstone, maybe, sorry, um, but 8,000 yeah. bottles at Christmas, you know, it's a hell of, a, hell of an operation. Uh, what I used to hear, Chris, was that your, your mum was from Drum Clinic, you know, and then a lot of the customers would have had carryouts in those days, and they brought these bottles back in by the bag load. And they were yeah, I remember the, 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 brown, the brown bags, like, yes, um, exactly, yeah. Yeah. We, we washed uh, those in a, in, a, in, a big, in a big sort of 600-gallon tank of cold water, and then coming... <laughs> McDermott used to who worked in Arthur McGill's was strong enough to lift the big firkins or the big the big the big barrels up for us to, to get them to go on. But we bottled on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday, I think. And then we yeah, then we we washed bottles the rest of the week and then carried them up into, into the shelves. But they had to be at least 21 days old and the, the temperature was very critical. I remember you talking about the heater. There was a wee bronze 
heater in, 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 the, in the store for keeping the guns at a certain temperature. And your mom was always very particular that this was temperature was kept exactly right because the carts would have popped otherwise if it was too warm. Yes, and I, I said in the book that they would pop if you opened the door on a particularly um, cold day. Um, yeah, would be, I said it'd be like the popping like a Gatling gun, which I'm sure you identify with, yes. <laughs> and is the Guinness today the same taste as the Guinness from that you would remember from? I'm sure you, you took the odd nip. No, I was too young then, to be honest with you. Um, right. um, when Don was there, um, maybe he could answer that question rather than me. Right. You didn't do a Brendan Behan then and start imbibing from... <laughs> no, from no, no, not really, no. Thank right. God. Aye. Aye, so and what, what was life like in the pub? You know, was it a, well, was it a hard existence? Uh, well, it was difficult for my mother because there were seven kids. I mean, my father died uh, when my mother was five months pregnant and uh, with Joni, our youngest. And in fact, she was the first to be born in hospital. So my mother was a midwife and qualified at St. Helens in, in, on Merseyside. And, um, and she uh, had the first six kids at home with um, Brenda McSorley's wife used to come over, the, the, uh, the district nurse or the maternity nurse, and all the kids were born at home and it was back to work. You know, that, that's, that's what it was like at the time, you know. And, um, you know, um, my eldest sister, my second eldest sister, Noelle, was born at Christmas called Noelle. You know, I'm born at Christmas called Christopher. The, you know, <laughs> life got on, you know, and, 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 and she, um, I'm sure Don may remember, you know, at, at that time, you know, Noelle being born on a party, my mother was back at work within a day, you know, that's the way it was. It you know. was, yeah, it was a, a different time, a different time, yeah. you know. But, but yeah, look, you know, uh, I have great memories of the pub and, and back in the old days, you know, the Halcyon days, as I call it in, in the memory in the book, you know, um, in the memoir, um, uh, pride in the father's name, even though I didn't know him, you know, we were very much in the gales of John Street, you know, our mother made sure we were, and we had that um, pride of thinking we were somebody, even if we weren't, you know, and, and it's important in life to, you know, to go through life with, with um, some sense of pride. Well, which I certainly did have in, in, in the family name and in, in my mother. And you obviously, uh, you know, there we are. Yeah. Well, it gives you a sense of who you are. That's it right. Carries you through life. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we've got plenty to be proud of, is what I would say. You know, I, I don't hide my light under a bushel. You know, I'm very proud of who I am and, uh, and where I come from and who my people are. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Well, learned more uh, people skills working and being brought up in a pub than you would have maybe learned at university or, or university of life perhaps, i'm sure oh absolutely 100 um, percent i think i read something you said about that maybe in a message to me but but i i could read people you know from a very early age you know i'd, I'd know I, I could as at 12 i was working in the pub myself after my mother died you know at 13 years old and yeah. uh, doing an after school shift from four to six yeah. and a fellow might come in who had been too much to drink already at that time of day it wouldn't have been unusual and you know you'd have to nurse him out the door without insulting him and uh, you know one thing and another so yeah you learn to grow up fast i'd say that's very true but, but the skills you learn i mean when i was a kid even younger than that selling raffle tickets in the bar you know and people would say to me oh christy you know you could sell snow to the eskimos or sand to the arabs you know and and, and there was a more than a hint of truth in that you know um and i remember i wrote in the book you know my bedtime would arrive when um, last job would be to, you remember this Don as well, you know, is to brush in front of the bar counter, the cigarette butts mm -hmm. and my old men stand at the bar counter yes. and sit down the high stool one time and stand yes. and another time and smoking. And then you clean up the cigarette butts and it'd, it'd be like pushing a brush uh, through snow. Uh, and then the stink of the cigarette butts, you know, be something awful. But then bedtime would come, as I wrote in the book, when, when Salvation Army would come in at 10 o'clock to sing the war cry. Um, and it was time for bed then. Um, so that was sort of the, the time to stop selling raffle tickets and, and leave the pub and go to bed. That's right. So yeah, all good memories, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember you had, you had a dark room upstairs, in, well, maybe one of the bedrooms converted, I'm not sure from memory. But I remember during the dark room, and stuff, the bar was extended there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would have been jammed. Um, that, that room later became a bedroom, as you said. Um, um, but yeah, you know, the, the, it was a busy bar. I mean, there was a dart room there and there was a pool room there. And, you know, yes. um, yeah. nearly everybody who grew up in Oma at that time came through the pub. You know, that's, that's the way I would look at it. I remember Pat Sharkey coming back from 
Ipswich and, and the whole hullabaloo about that, you know, and uh, uh, obviously a big local hero. And I was absolutely thrilled to see him in the pub, you know. And, and so that's the sort of thing, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. Speaking about memories, I'm going to tell you something now that seems quite funny when you look back on it. But uh, your mum took you all the way to a holiday somewhere. I think maybe around Donegal, I'm not sure. Um, Dermot and I were left in charge of the bar. And we locked up as usual. But you know, your bar, it could have been half one, two o'clock before people got away. And, Absolutely, uh, yes. We, we were tucked up in bed, and we fast asleep. And we heard this banging downstairs. And it was at the time, this, this voice was saying, let me out, let me out. And your, yes. father, your father had a shotgun on top of the wardrobe. I, I'm going to know who this is, by the way. Another publican from across the street. We can't mention any names, but uh, I went down the stairs and there was behind me with your father. It wasn't loaded, and your father's shotgun. We, we didn't know what we were going to face down there, but we'd accidentally locked the guy in the toilets who fell, fell asleep. Well, well, Fra Francie O'Neill, Francie O'Neill, who was a great friend of the family and, and lived yeah, across yeah. the road. Um, yeah. Just turn that down for me, please. Um, I lived across the road. I spent many a night in our house, you know, we'd fall asleep on the high stool and, and then we'd, we'd take him upstairs and roll him into a bed, you know. Yes. Yeah, he was, a, he was a great guy and, and a great friend of the family. He took me to my first Ulster final in 1973 and All-Ireland final in the same year when, when Troll Miners won, Donald Donnelly, another great man. Yes. Um, so there we go. That's that. Yeah, so they, they, they were, that, but that's the way it was in the day, you know. And, yeah. Obviously, people would disapprove of a lot of that today, but that's the way it was in the day. Probably the social workers may have something to say, but, you know, <laughs> that's what it was. And as you said, I said, that we learned a lot of life skills about dealing with people, and I certainly used it to, to, to good effect in my own life uh, and the work that I've done later on in life about how, how well, to work. Yes, selling, selling skills as well, you know. I mean, just yeah. as, I, as I say, um, it, it's, it might sound counterintuitive in terms of selling, but when to pull them and to push, you know, it's yeah. when you're doing, even though you're on a telephone line, you know, to wait, to think, well, actually, there's not much point pursuing this. I'll, I'll, I'll make it, I'll make a call tomorrow or, you know, just it, those are important things. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely selling in the pub. Yeah. Huge, huge experience. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll invite the deck to talk about it as well. Over the years, the staff and Declan have recorded a lot of interviews uh, of, of voices, some you'll know, some some you won't remember. But oh, it's a very special town, and especially around the Gallows Hill in the town, I see it as particularly special because despite that everyone shared what they had, Chris, I'm, I'm sure you find that in the bar as well, there was never any sense of, of sectarianism or of people not belonging. It's where you hung your hat on a Sunday. It was Omar like that, and I think that left Omar a very special town. And well, I agree. Um... You know, my father worked in, it's in the book, but my father worked in a, in a pub in Belfast called Holy Joe's. And that wasn't the proper name, but I can't recall what it was. Um, um, and the guy worked, this was in a largely Protestant area, I say, shipyard area in Belfast, um, East Belfast. And, and he, um, you know, when he came back to Oman, bought the pub, which I think was 19... 55, 53, something like that. Um, for a period, he would have worked in what was another Miguel's in High Street, which is now Daly's, of course, um, which was Frank Miguel, who I think was the first chairman or president of Roma and uh, And his brother was John Miguel, the town clerk, not related to us, just as Jackie and Teddy weren't, but probably all related somewhere if you go back far enough. Um, anyway, um, so he bought the pub and then my mother, they got married and the bar was run very much on a cross community basis. No, absolutely no sectarianism. And, and in her day, I remember very, very well, some great friends, that one great friend of the family, uh, one I'd say in particular, who, who liked to sing rebel songs, got barred on a regular basis. There was just no such thing as um, politics were banned and, and absolutely singing rebel songs was banned. Yeah. But, um, you know, as I say in the book, all that fell away as we progressed into the early 1970s, uh, when the troubles really got going. And, and as I said in the book, um, people reverted to their own tribe whether they liked it or not you know i would describe the troubles as a tribal conflict going back 400 years to the plantation of ulster and whether we like it or not you know when the troubles really got going you were catholic or protestant and that was it you know people may have chosen differently but unfortunately you know as we saw with whitey hannigan um you know a great man people got very very violent and life was different Indeed, and we'll not talk too long about that. But at the same time, you know, the, you know, 
people had a vested interest in keeping people apart in this town and it, it served an agenda. But, uh, but let's, let's move to the, to the, to the reason of, of why you left Oma and uh, maybe you could talk about the accident you had as well where you met him to, where your little rental car where you, where you had an accident uh, uh, that nearly cost you your life, Chris. Yeah, I was very, very, very lucky. I mean, it's impossible to describe how lucky I was. I was driving in a tin box, you know, and uh, went under a lorry and, and, and got basically cut and crushed by the wheel of the lorry, you know, a combination of crush injuries and, and severing. Um, and I was literally just about to die. I mean, I, you know, within a split second and, and, the, and the lorry came over the car, over the engine of the car. And um, was careering on top of me and I went over the steering wheel and, and turned the steering wheel. And, and, you know, instead of beheading me, it severed me instead. But I got absolutely torn to pieces, my arms and, and hands and head. And, you know, um, so the injuries themselves have been very, very lucky with, um, you know, uh, the, the repair. I mean, I was kept alive on, at the scene of the crash um, by an 18 year old nurse who got into the smoking car and saved my life. It's the most amazing thing. Um, and to happen to anybody and then I was very lucky because a consultant from Belfast was at the local hospital at Daisy Hill Hospital in Newry I was driving from Belfast to Dublin um, and uh, he was able to help put me on a ventilator and save my life which he said afterwards had he not have been there and it hadn't happened I would have died so I was very very lucky the Humpty Dumpty man is where that term comes from they put me back together again and called me the Humpty Dumpty man five surgeons for five hours in the Ulster Hospital in Belfast there you go. What year was that, Chris? Uh, 1988. So it's a long time ago. I was 25 years old. I mean, I was old enough and fit enough, dare I say, uh, but very, very lucky. You know? uh, so it took a year out of my life. Uh, I went, I went and I was in hospital, had my jaw broken. So I couldn't, once the wires came out of my jaw, I was capable of being released. And um, I then went to rehab in, in, on the uh, Hollywood Road in Belfast. So I travel every day from Oma to Belfast for rehab. Um, and one of the things I wrote was because I was really very badly injured. I mean, I was very significantly badly injured. So um, I couldn't uh, walk up and down a bus, a moving bus, because I couldn't use my hands and my arms. And one of the great moments in my life of thinking about these things was I had to say to the, the bus driver in Belfast, so come on the coach for a moment to Belfast. And then I'd get the bus from the Great Victoria Street over to the Hollywood Road to a place called the Joss Cardwell Rehabilitation Centre. And um, and I'd had to say to the bus driver, um, do you mind um, waiting until I sit down? I'm handicapped. And that was quite a word. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite a moment uh, when I had to admit that. So, But, but I, I, I got over that. You know, I would, certainly wouldn't describe myself handicapped today. And I don't go for a handicap pass or anything like that. And... You know, I, I'm very much, um, it was a period in life, one year over. Yeah. And the day, the day the accident happened, what, what path were you on? You know, wh where were, were you going and, you know, before your life just dramatically changed in, in a, not a split second, but a very short period? All the way through my life, I regard myself as being very, very lucky, you know. So I went back to school at 18. Um, and I, um, you know, went home with tech, I haven't, um, um, well, the story which is that my brother, Paul, who was 13 going 14, so he's probably 14, three months after our mother died, was, had his scholarship terminated at the CBS grammar school. Um, and, and I left too. So we both went to St. Pat's, um, we were very lucky to, um, you know, under the, the care of Donald Donnelly there, who was a great man for us. But anyway, we still drifted through life. And um, I went back to school at 18. And in the meantime, we had spent, I had spent longer than him, but together several months in, in hospital in Belfast, uh, in, in, in um, Forster Green Hospital um, uh, with tuberculosis. So um, anyway, um, coming out of there, which was like a, an internment or a jail sentence, you know, really. Um, coming out of there, um, I decided it was time to go back to school, basically. But, but in the meantime, you know, I couldn't work because I was infected, infectious, and I was on the sick for a long time and on the dole. And but went back to school, major, major chance. Then I quickly went through the system and got into Queens, and then I got into Deloitte. And then I um, got a job with... Ulster Bank on the investment side because all my life I was a gambler, which is a function of carrying bets to the boogies 
Barney Curley's bookies, as we called it, in, in Cavlin Road. Um, and so because we had no parents around, you know, and we were like basically <clears throat> doing, doing what you did. And so for me, it was gambling. And, um, you know, and you had to be good at it because, you know, there was no pot of money to spend. And, and so basically I, I became very proficient at first horses and then poker. Um, so then I used that sort of brain thing um, from counting drinks in the pub, Donald, you know, and um, um, and doing marking the dartboard to, you know, doing mental maths. And, and I ended up doing economics in, at Queens. And uh, then I got into Deloitte and then I got into Ulster Bank. And, and trading stocks and shares was just the same to me as reading the forum for resources. Yeah. You know, just the same sort of mental process. Uh, working out what was right and what was wrong, which was good and which was bad, what to buy, what to sell. Do you think the, that your, your childhood actually taught you the price of things and the value of things? Well, uh, that's a great line from, from Oscar Wilde, which, which I <laughs> often like to quote. Um, you know, uh, Oscar Wilde, a, a cynic, uh, knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. So, so absolutely, um, I, um, I do. I try. You know, I try to be a good person like everybody else. But, I, but I, I value. I, I, I know the value of everything. Like it's just part of my DNA. You know, my my natural uh, innate thing. I, I, I judge everything. I listen to everything. I make make opinions on everything. So, for a lot of people, I'm a total pain in the backside. But on the other hand, <laughs> it's how my brain works. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and and Chris, why the book? What what spurred the book on? And you know, what, what was the moment we said, "I'm putting it all down and you know, on, on paper." Well, that's a continuation. So so I crashed when I was working for Ulster Bank in Dublin. I then had a court case, um, which I lost. Uh, was a civil case, and then um, I. Um, I basically went to London on a need basis and I, I sort of caught the bottom of a major boom in the stock market from 19, um, that case, that was 91, uh, through to when I worked 11 years at Merrill Lynch, basically from there and had a, had a, you know, was there at the very, very peak of the, the bull market that was the dot-com boom. Um, mm -hmm. So that requires, you know, the stock market is a very particular place to be. You know, it's, it's, it's a highly aggressive dog eat dog world. You know, it's, it's not what you see on the news, you know, it's um, everybody is trying to beat everybody. And, and there's a certain characteristic that you have to have to do it and do it well. And so as well as growing up in the, in the pub and growing up in Oma with the troubles going on all around me, you know, and I, I was never involved in the troubles, but you know, I was, it was going on all around us, you know, don't, don't underestimate that. Um, and, um, um, you know, and, and, and also the boxing, I was a uh, county champion boxer a couple of times. So, you know, I, I, so when I was on about poker and in, in the story, I said that, um, you know, that the control discipline, which you learn it from Paddy Crawford or Paddy Galise um, at Oma Boxing Club or Charlie McQuaid, uh, Charlie Colton, there's a couple of names for you. Um, you know, that that which you learn is then used in poker and used in the city. And, you know, it's all the same sort of. A controlled aggression you, you have to win right because you've got to be right for every buyer there's a seller someone's right and someone's wrong you know and it's it's the need to be right not all the time but as a significant amount of the time which leads to huge pressures you know and the sums involved are billions literally and you know um that's all in the story as well so i did get to a natural end which is the burnout phase which is not unique to me um, but I went away to write the book and clear my head for a couple of years, basically. So I did three years in what I call a darkened room. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but right. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. just to try and to collate everything and make sense of it and maybe write your way through it. Yeah, in the beginning, it was what I call an ugly chronicle. So A to Z of my life, you know, and it, it, it was rubbish, you know. Uh, and then I tried to make it better and it didn't get any better and, and eventually gave up. But then once upon a time, I went back to the scene of the crash and and uh, and had a, some flashbacks and, and that prompted me to start writing again. Um, shortly after that, I got a book publishing offer from a group in Dublin called Liberty's Press, which I didn't take because I wasn't looking for one. I was using a, a literary agency in Dublin to help me improve the story, not to publish it. Um, and then after that, the lockdown allowed me to finish it. So that's why I finished it because of lockdown. I started writing again in March. So, yeah, it's been a long, long time. I mean, 18 years since I started and, and, and 
without any fear of contradiction, I've written for four years, you know, sitting on the stool that I'm sitting on today <laughs> for four years, you know, it's a long time, yeah. uh -huh. but, it, but I'm very happy with it, really happy. Good. Good. Well, then, you know, could you go back to that world, the, the aggressive world of the stocks and shares and the, 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 the kind of the, the, the bullish nature of the, of the work, you know? They say it's a young man's game, and I agree with that. You know, um, mm -hmm. start, this is stock broking now. There's investment banking and there's different types of things. You can always be an investment banker, but um, that's the sort of graduation process. You, you, you start as a broker, you become a banker, you're an investment banker. But having left the industry, that, that role is gone. Uh, there's, yeah. there's no scope to do that. Um, in addition, um, my clients were the Dublin investment community, which I worked in and then moved to service. Um, and then basically they all went quite belly up, a lot of them in, in the mid 2000s. So the client sums under management substantially declined. And, you know, when I came back to the city, um, there was there was quite a quite a decline in, in, in the opportunity. But not blaming anyone. That's my own choice for having left for three years. So uh -huh. I came back in in 2005 and did a couple of years, but never at the same level. My My, my jargon on it is. You know, when you play for Man United, Merrill Lynch, when you play for Man United, you're Merrill Lynch, right? So we were the top team in the country by 100 miles. And yeah. I was one of the star strikers. And, and when you play for Man United and you leave, uh -huh. you don't get back. Simple. Yeah. 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 And as you say, it's a young man's game in a way, you know, is that because the young can take the pressure? And the naivety uh, of young. That's it's because. not the pressure. It's 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 just the whole sheer duration of it. It's twenty four seven, seven days a week. So, if you're running a you know a big position in the stock that you bought or sold, I mean, you know, um, you know, it's with you all the time. You know, so you're reading the Sunday papers from a, for the purpose to get information on that or other things. You know, so Sunday is not a day off. You know, um, in my case, I was a big gambler as well. So I, all my Saturdays were spent at race courses in England um you know so it was like continuation of the thing you know the boiling pot yeah but but it's part of your nature you know i think it's in my nature to be that way and, and yeah. unfortunately uh, rather i can't say unfortunately i mean i had a hell of a life you know i can't complain it was it was amazing it was amazing actually well you see at that at that, that level you know for, for as you say you know you're the claim or a champion how did you relax you know what was your how did you wind down or did you wind down did the adrenaline keep you going as you say seven days a week it was definitely seven days a week and 24 7 so you know bedtime would be watching american television news to see what's happening in stocks and wall street and you know um every morning the alarm bell went to 5 30 for a seven o'clock morning meeting uh, so i had a driver you know i got to work very comfortably but but nonetheless, you know, uh, which I paid for myself. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the continuous uh, requirements. So because I ran Ireland from London, I spent one or two days every week on a plane, you know, so the, getting, getting the 6.30 flight to Dublin meant, right. meant um, you know, getting up at four o'clock sort of thing. And, and uh, you know, you may have got to bed at midnight. So the days were long and the, and, and the nights were short. And yeah. there was a, my idea of relaxation was betting on horses. It's not everyone's idea, so that really didn't didn't help, I suppose, and then it added to the twenty four seven nature of the thing. My goodness, and how's life now? Very different, you know. You have to reflect <laughs> and look back. <laughs> uh -huh. So I've, I've I've got four kids. My eldest is at Bath. My my son is probably, I uh, say, with a fair degree of confidence, going to Cambridge. Right. So um, you know, there's plenty of uh, the bloodline, as I always refer to it in horse racing terms. The bloodline is good. Yeah. Very happy. My wife's from Wexford and in, in, uh, down south, and um, you know we, uh, we live in London. We've been together for twenty five years, whatever it is. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Take me back to Don't John Street. Take me back to John Street and growing up in John Street could you, again, because and your relationship with with Paul, um, your brother Martin, who's sadly no longer with us as well. Um, just just for the, for the people of Oman, just a quick picture for us, if you will. Um, well, Paul uh, Martin, um, very unfortunate situation that just happened, you know, it's one of those things. Um, uh, Paul was a, a long drawn out sort of um, thing and that problem with alcohol. So as I say uh, in the story, um, uh, my vice and it is a vice was gambling. 
and his vice was booze. So, um, you know, um, so I went back to school at 18 and he went into an alcohol treatment center at 18. And it's hard to comprehend that, you know. Um, uh, but he actually went sober then for um, 25 years, a long, long time. Yeah, um, Not 25 years, probably 18 years to take it back. Um, and then I suppose he had a bit of a midlife crisis and, and you know, eventually went for a period, went sober again. And then eventually died of a brain hemorrhage, which was not related to alcohol, but, you know, I suppose that's that. So, so yeah, Paul was a very smart guy, you know, a very bright man and um, really helped himself and, and fixed his life very well and went back to school and was working in, in Edinburgh with his wife. And uh, he met his wife in, in Derry and um, went to Edinburgh and um, went through the Open University and, Got a, got a science degree and, and became a teacher in the beginning um, in sink schools in, in Glasgow. Uh, and then later as in, in Edinburgh, where he lived um, in a place in, Dal in Dalkeith in a secondary school. So, yeah, there was an, an awful lot of tributes when he died uh, in relation to the good guy that he was and, and his commitment to, this, to the kids. Very different life from me. And, 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 and that's something to reflect on, Declan, you know, and, and, yeah. and Don, you know, um, uh, which it's also reflected on in the book, you know, uh, that 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 relationship and and but we were, um, you know, we did have our conflicts, but we were entirely reconciled um, before he died. Well, that's that's everything. And families are complicated. I mean, it, as you know, Chris, and then in yours particularly so because you were often quite young and having to live with with a public house. Your house was public to some extent. You didn't have a family life that that most people would perceive. But despite all that, I think there's, you know, all adversity carries with it the seed of an equal or a better opportunity. So I think you've taken great advantage of all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of describing it, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> you make a good point uh, about not having a, um, a family um, unit because, you know, because we had no father at that stage. You know, my mother had remarried, but, you know, not, not in the business. She remarried later, rather. Um, um, the good man, Paki O'Hagan, um, very good man. Um, um, life was just about work, really, and, and, and the customers used our facilities, you know, and when the bar was busy, the ladies in the pub from the snugs would have come up and used the family's toilets and that sort of thing. Um, and um, and there's a great story, actually, that didn't make the book. I had written it, but my editor cut it. <laughs> but it's about Santa Claus, you know. So Oma had two Santa Clauses in Anderson's and Woolworth's. But both of them drank in the pub, right? <laughs> so, so we had Bobby Kelly and George Burns, right? Um, George Burns, I think, was from Gordrush, Gordmore Park, and there, and Bobby was uh, just up beside O'Kane Park there. And um, one night, anyway, on a Christmas Eve, the two men had come into the pub in their, in their Santa outfits after they finished on Christmas Eve. It was sort of a, a done thing. You might remember that, Don, I don't know. But anyway... Um, it was decided anyway that, that one of them, I won't say who, would, would go and surprise my two younger sisters who were having their, their Saturday evening baths. And uh, as I said somewhere, but it didn't, it didn't make the book because it got cut. But I said there were there were tears, but not of joy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know when Santa Claus turned up and the two kids aged six and four, Bridgie and Joni, um, got the surprise of their life. Yeah. There we are. So that's the story, uh, you know, the, the pub as it was, yeah, and people, people being around, yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me about your mum. Your mum was from Drumquin and you were saying she was a midwife as well. I mean, you're, uh, still know her extended family as well. And your aunt Eileen used to come into the bar, I remember her. When, uh, but before that, I remember you as a young lad come up to the bar. Your mum would never allow you to have a Coke, but you were allowed yeah. uh, a ginger cordial or a black fruit cordial or some of those things. Yeah. Every, every time you left with a drink of cordial, you had a Coke in your pocket as well. <laughs> I can see it gone, but uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say I'd say um, everyone feels the same. But I had a very special relationship with her, you know, and yes. and I think she, um, you know, the term in the house was the glamour boy. You know, you may have heard that term around. I don't know, but but Paul was originally the glamour boy, and then it passed to me. And 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 this is it's a thing which is, um, as I said in the book, it's an expectation of academic success, but it's also just. You know, every house had to have one gentleman, my mother used to say, you know, and um, and in her house, it was her brother, Mick, who graduated from Queens as well, as it happens. Uh, and he was a Belfast pharmacist, another super guy, a very bright man. And um, 
And that was very unusual. So him and her both went to um, secondary school in Oma. Um, and in, that, in those days, um, you had to pay for a secondary school education. So two of them were, were riding a bike in and out from Drumquin, Lake Freshie, the hills above Drumquin, uh, a 10 mile there and 10 mile back round trip every day on a bike to go to school and have someone pay for that as well. So yeah, look, it was very different then, but but there was always a big focus on academic success through my mother, who was a very bright woman. And, you know, in a different era, she had been, would have been, you know, a midwife was a big qualification at that time, you know, and she achieved what was achievable at that time. But but she was a very bright woman. Yeah. And Eileen and all these people, they have a sort of photographic memory. You hear all this stuff about cousins and aunts. You know, I'm sure every family has one person like that, you know, but there used to be a lot of talk about the in-laws and, who, who married who and where they were from and you know the whole story. Yeah, That's right. the, the family historian with Absolutely. a computer like brain. <laughs> That's right. First, second, yep. third cousins. <laughs> That's right. We had we had we had a few of them. Everyone has one at least, you know. So yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> do, do you get back home at all, Chris? No, not really. To be honest with you, um, um, you know, I'm very, very, very pleased um, to have sold the pub to Andrew Short. And why I say that so emphatically is it's very important when you're handing over the family family heirlooms, you know, um, that it goes to somebody who's prepared to make that investment and 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 work towards a high quality venue, which he has done. Uh, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, so um, you know, had, had a bit, had I just sold it and, and and cashed it in? I mean, back in 2008, the financial outcome would have been a whole lot better, but. Um, I'm very happy that I sold it to someone who's going to keep on the heritage of the place. And um, so, so for that reason, I, I've got no purpose to go there. I mean, obviously, I've got four sisters living locally. Um, but, you know, in terms of going over there, uh, there's no parents and one thing and another, you know, so it's, it's different, right? Yeah, well, I think that's what happens, you know, when the, when they, the parental side goes, you know, you, in a way, you don't cut ties, but the, the ties are loosened. That's right. I mean, my, my personal love um, is Tyrone, you know, and, and Tyrone Gaelic, you know, going, since going back to the Ulster final against Down and, and seeing Frank McGuigan play back then in the minor match and so on. I mean, that's my personal love um, and to some extent my family, dare I say, you know. Uh, uh, and in the story, you know, um, Tyrone is a constant with Paul and me from the beginning to the end, you know, and uh, so it, it sort of ends up with the All-Ireland, you know, in 2007, you know, and sort of... Uh, yeah, great days. Great yeah, days. Yeah, absolutely. Andrew Short has changed the pub beyond recognition, but he has kept the, the front door step. You remember the mosaic front door step, Chris, with the, uh, is it Tom O'Kane licensed to sell? That's right, pub. yeah. Yeah. I, I, every time I walk past, I look in and I look at that, and a lot of a lot of memories come, come flooding past, you know, all of the days. When a wee snug was into the right, I'm sure you remember it as well. And, yes. Uh, and you described so well, sweeping up in the morning, and you lift the four stools and put them up in the bar. And, you, and your mom had old bus seats in the very early days. I'm not sure you remember that. There were actually bus seats. Yes. Uh, around the back. It was the most comfortable, warm club, club to work in, I must say. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned so much from as a very young child just being there and being immersed in, in that sort of atmosphere. Although it did have its challenges as well, but uh, it, it was a great, great, uh, great place to learn. And I think we've all learned from that. Yeah, no, I, I, I should correct something there. I mean, there'd be a whole lot of people firing darts at me. Uh, the All Ireland was 2008. Uh, <laughs> we uh, wouldn't know, Chris. <laughs> 2003, 2005, and 2008. So, anyway, the reason I mentioned 2007 is that's when Paul died. But, oh, yeah. you know, um, that's the connection. So, from the beginning to the end, um, yeah. Toronto in the story. Um, you mentioned, I mentioned Hells Above Drum Quinn earlier, and there's some, been some great times, you know. Um, Felix Kearney, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, my mother was very, obviously very fond and very re um, revering of him, you know, I mean, a great man he was. And, and I remember I when went your to bar schools. Times, Chris, I remember him as a customer in your bar, yeah, coming in. That's right. So I have a memory of him coming in uh, before he died, and he was a man of very advanced age at that stage. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of my, the memories that sticks with me, I mean, on, probably because I realized that she was so deferential towards him, you know, that. Uh, you know, in a positive way, he was just delighted to see him, and he probably come in to see her. He wasn't into drink, I wouldn't say, you know, but and it was really lovely. So yeah, that's another great man, Felix Kearney. Yeah. Well, you see, you were there at the outbreak of the civil rights as well. So and, and you've seen a lot of changes from you know community strife. Um, what was a very 
good place to work. John Street became a difficult part of town as well for a few years, and thankfully those days are now behind us. But would you regard Oma still as home to you or not? Or would you say it's oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, as I said, Oma and Tyrone, you know, absolutely. Um, 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 look, you know, home is home, right? Um, and I, I, so I very much look forward to going back and, 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 and doing... Um, a book signing, dare I say, I've been asked about that in the Herald and so on. And, and um, but yeah, look, I'll be in the blind cobbler, that's for sure. You know, I'll probably, well, I'll John, probably cross, well, I'll John. probably cross over to Sally O'Brien's as well. You know, and, and uh, <laughs> yes. nothing gave me more happiness than being around John Street. Absolutely, yeah. totally. Yeah. Well, then, your book is available, yes, on on Amazon, and is it that's pure on, on? There's an audio version as well. You're saying we've got we've got the ebook, um, we've got the paperback. And the paperback's astonishing. I'm Amazon print on demand, and you can literally order it one day and get it the next if you're on Amazon Prime. Um, and for this week, we've been working on uh, Audible, which is the Amazon uh, audio side. So that's a quite a lot of work, actually. Um, you know, um, there's a, a reader from, well-known man from Oma as well, um, um, Colin Gormley, Paddy Gormley's son. And, and um, you know, back in the day when there were no phones in Oma, you know, it's a great story. Um, our phone, and you you will remember well, and in fact, you've indicated that, was number 364. And I remember it becoming 2364, and then I remember it becoming 242364. Um, anyway, when it was 364 back in the day, my father had the, the phone, and Arthur McGill would have been operating next door, and we'd been taking calls for the furniture store. But we'd also taken calls for um, Paddy Gormley, the singer, who's Colin Garnley's dad, of course, who's the guy who's now at the Royal Shakespeare Company and is doing the audible read for me, uh, which is great because he's got entirely got the accent. So, and and it's, it's, it's actually sometimes very weird listening to this guy reading your own book and in, in your own voice almost, you know. And uh, so, so that's going on this week. We've done about 13 hours so far. So it's a lot of work. Uh, we've got about three and a half hours of, of actual um, finished um, pages. But, uh, you know, it's, it's three or four times ratio because everything stops and starts and stops and starts. And it's quite an exercise. And, and we're working in the studio. It's called Bush Studios in, in Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. And, you know, there are banners there for Liam Gallagher and the Cores and also uh, Rita Ora, people who've been recording music there. So it's a fine place to be. It's all very, very, very enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the phone number. It's funny the uh, we used to take calls for the hairdressers next door as well. Duncan's had a yeah. Um, was that uh, what's her name? Um, um, hey, hey, Duncan had a sister. Maureen Golligy, was it? That's right. Yeah, she was there as well. Yeah. God, I remember that very well. And you had to look down and, and say, "Look, there's a phone call," and they'd come up. And <laughs> but that's the way it was in those days. People didn't realize that you know phones were a, 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 an item of luxury. You know. Well, as I said, I mean, our phone was the 364th phone in Oma. Yeah. That's all there were, you know. If you think, if you, if you think about it, there would, there would have been at least 10,000 people there at that time. Oh, probably more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're among the few, but uh, interesting times. So looking back, Chris, what would, what changes would you make if you could? Or what would you younger you now if you could sort of jump forward and back again? I think, you know... Uh, I don't dwell on the past, but we did, we were dealt a very bad hand of cards, you know, from using the program analogy, um, and things were very difficult. So I think I think anybody would wish for a better life than we had, put it simply. Um, I don't think people can fully comprehend uh, this. You know, as you said, I haven't really con considered it that way. The public house event, your home was not your own. I've, I've actually never thought of it that way, but your point is totally valid. Um, and, you know, with the loss of our father and then, the need for our mother to work 24 seven and, and just very difficult times. And then the trouble starting and, you know, I, I wouldn't underestimate, I don't think enough people are, are honest enough about it. The troubles were really, really bad. You know, I mean, you were every day of the week, there was someone not, not in Omen, thank God, but the news was full of, you know, death and destruction in Belfast and Derry in particular, you know, and, you know, and then all the way through to the tensions of the hunger strikes and, you know, all of that. So, um, and you know, um, you know, that's your, it's a tribal conflict, right? And you're, you're one side or the other, you know, whether you like it or not, is my common phrase for it. And um, you know, I was glad, always glad to leave it all, leave all that behind. Let me tell you, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I remember going to Dublin actually to work. Uh, it was phenomenal because it came out of Belfast, and you know, the tension in Belfast. I mean, I write this story in the book. It's a great line. It's a true story. 
I'm working in Deloitte in Belfast and the boss, who's a really good guy from County Down, the Gaelic guy, and he said to me, with a very identifiably Catholic name, right? So he said to me, uh, uh, Christy, he said, um, we're going to have to change his name or words to that effect. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're going to send you out in the job and your name from now on is Chris Miguel because you're too easily identified as a Catholic. Yeah. And that's a true story. Yeah. Yeah. So um, people forget that, you know, but it's a true story. Um, so from that moment on, I became Chris Miguel. And prior to that, um, all the way through Queens and into work, I was Christy Miguel. I'm very proud of it. Um, and I never considered any other way. Um, the name Christy came to me through Christy Ring, the great heart, cork hurler. And the man who gave me that name is a man called Jim McGlone, who had the um, place down in the back market, the shop. You'll remember that, Don. You'll, you'll remember yeah. Jim McGlone very well. Or he called himself McGloin. Jim McGloin. Yeah, the back market just behind the, uh, yeah, yeah. the uh, like almost like a, fun, fun, like a pop-up shop today, I suppose. That's what right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, Bar uh, Barney McAleer's mentioned in the story as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Ad Aladdin's Cave of, um, of Clothes. It goes searching for stuff. Yeah. You have it all. We used to take a little book and go to Fred Todd's and get biscuits and stuff for ourselves, Dermot and I, when we were in the bar. And then uh, we were confused. <laughs> Paddy Devon had a book as well, but we kicked Paddy Devon's book to Fred Todd's. And then when it goes, <laughs> nobody knew who to pay what. <laughs> well, well, we, we own Paddy Devlin, we own Paddy Devlin's shop. And then we had a, a food book there to get yes. all the food we needed because, yeah. you know, the, yeah. and then eventually, as I said in the book, the, 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 the food bill exceeded the rent in period of time as the family started growing up. Yeah. But then we have, of course, we went to Mrs. Wilson as well, um, um, yeah. over further over in John Street. And, yeah. and of course, who else? Gallagher's um, ice cream shop. Yeah. And um, uh, who else? Uh, the, the, the chipper over in Georgia Street and Barney Hohe and um, okay. over there. Yeah. The shop, Highland, Highland Cafe. Yeah, the Highland Cafe, that's right. Joe, Joe Mellon, the, the Demon Barber. <laughs> yes, yes. Those, those, those are all the... And what was it? Jack Garrity and the Chip Shop. Yeah. Yes, right. Jack Garrity's Chip Shop, that's right, in the Highland Cafe. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to Dr. and I today. I really appreciate your take time out. And uh, every success with your book and the rest of your life. And I think, you know, uh, you're swimming downstream now, so take, take every day as it comes and enjoy it, I suppose. And... Uh, Thanks for, for the lovely memories and, and sharing this with us today. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure. Um, I do like talking, so you know it's. But <laughs> uh, but um, thank you, Don. Thank you, thank you, Declan. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, uh, it's it. been a pleasure and uh, delighted to share the same platform with the great Jackie McGale. So what more can I say? Oh yeah, indeed. Chris, take care. So we'll chat soon. Okay, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, All Declan. The best. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.